Good evening from Warsaw, Poland, here at the 18th International Chopin Piano Competition. My name is Rachel Naomi Kudo. And I'm Alessandro Tomasi. And uh, today we have a fantastic guest with us. Jan Lyszewski. Wielka przyjemność z Państwem być. Great pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you really for being our guest today at Chopin Talk. It's a great, great honor. Thank you. So, um, so Jan, uh, our first question. Do you remember the first time you heard <laughs> Chopin? <laughs> sure. I think it would have been probably one of the concertos uh, played by Christian Zimmerman. My parents were not musicians, but classical music was certainly in the house, and I think one of the first recordings would have been that, because they loved playing it. And I simply remember hearing it and enjoying all the colors of the orchestra, of the piano, and, and really living through that Chopin. Of course, it accompanied me for many, many years afterwards when I was playing Chopin. And now, to be honest, I would struggle to listen through to that recording because I've had so many of my own experiences with the concertos, which are so deeply ingrained that I, I couldn't enjoy so much the recording. But, but it's still there. It has a very big part of my life. That's a beautiful recording. Yeah, it's an a incredible recording, one. yes. Yeah. <laughs> very special. Yeah, exactly. Definitely, very definitely special. one that everybody keeps really close to the heart, especially Chopin related. And speaking about Chopin recordings, mm -hmm. you also have quite a history <laughs> there already. Uh, despite your young age, you have quite a few recordings of Chopin's music, uh, both with orchestra and also on solo. And I would really love to start asking you about your new recording, 2021, <laughs> about Chopin Nocturnes. How did it happen? Why did you choose to, to, to just to decide to face, because it's really huge to do all Chopin Nocturnes? It's something that I've been thinking about and dreaming about for years. I think uh, the plan actually hatched almost as soon as I started recording for Deutsche Grammophon, but it took me this many years to get That's to the point where ago. I... It's <laughs> 10 years ago. So yeah. it took me this many years to get to the point that I actually felt like I could go into the studio and record. And the reason for that is that Chopin Nocturnes are incredibly individual and uh, they are intimate. And you, in a sense, you want to be playing them for yourself, but you're not. When you're in the studio, when you're in the hall, you're playing them for others. So you have to share this intimate vision, but also combine it with something that is relatable. And to find that, I needed to play all of them in concert. And of course, there's 21. They're almost two hours of music. So to, to do that, to play them all in a concert hall, took me quite a few seasons uh, of recitals. They were always present, and I always had the chance to, to incorporate them. And, and finally, last year, during the pandemic, there was the chance to record. And it hasn't actually been quite a year since the recording, which took place in late October of 2020. Uh, which is incredible to think because it seems like an eternity ago for me by this point. Yeah, of course. And I was wondering, with these so personal pieces, are you ever afraid it, about the risk of recording them too soon, for example? What about I change my com completely change my interpretation of Chopin Nocturne in 20 years? Do I record them again <laughs> from the beginning? I'm very traditional in my recording, so I always want for the recording to be the best that it possibly can which of course is limited by the fact that it can only be the best that it can possibly can in that very moment. Uh, when I was 25 and I recorded them and I fully realized that if I look back in 20 years that I probably will have a different vision. The question though is whether it'll be a better one or not. And you, you face that same question if you, for example, look at Glenn Gould's two recordings of the Goldberg variations. I think that's the most frequent example that we can look at early in his life, late in his life. And, there are differing opinions. Do you prefer the first one, which was more natural, more uh, just simply following his emotion? Or do you prefer the second one, which was, of course, very uh, thought through, full of wisdom, mm -hmm. full of experience, but it has a completely different sentiment as a result? So yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not disqualifying that option. <laughs> I would love to know, because you're, you're so impressive, I mean, not just um, your recording disc discography, um, but your repertoire, how you've been exploring not just Chopin, but also traversing into Schumann, Mendelssohn, you did Lieder, also Beethoven with Matthias Gornet, um, and you also play, conduct the Beethoven All Five Piano Concerti, and you've done also the cycles um, over two days, which is quite a feat. I mean, both physically, <laughs> stamina, and also your your mental, you know, uh, space. Just pacing yourself. I mean, pacing yourself. How well? How do you do that? Of course, but also, how do you find your own voice? I mean, this is a repertoire that we're very familiar with and and quite traditional, like you said. But how how are you inspired this way? 
it's, of course, a very challenging question to answer. How, how do we find our own voice? And I think all the contestants here are, are facing that challenge in their own way. Uh, some of them embrace it and go to the extremes, and others internalize it and try to be proper. And, and you f hear very different results. There isn't a good way to approach it. It has to be, I guess, in the end, from your heart and from your mind. And that's how it comes, of course, when I'm playing something like Beethoven. I'm not trying to reinvent Beethoven. I'm not trying to uh, be better than those that have come before me, because I have the greatest respect for other recordings that, that I love and I cherish. But if I feel that I have something to say, then I will say it. And generally, I think the, the basis for many of the things that I do is just looking into the score. And sometimes I look into the score and find things that uh, others have overlooked, be it because of tradition or simply ease of playing or um, some sort of uh, belief that what's in the score is incorrect. And of course, there is that belief sometimes because we, we've played it, we have experience, and we say, no, this is impossible. The composer surely could not have intended for that to be the case. And sometimes you look back and you think, wait, well, it actually can work that way. And why, why are we doing this? Why are we changing a tempo here? Why are we not following this dynamic? Why are we not? using the pedal marking as he did. And to what degree do we want to do that? And of course, without becoming hyper-analytical, that is sort of what our role is as interpreters, is to look back and, and respect with the utmost clarity what the composer intended, what he put in. Of course, adding our personal touch, but uh, without sort of superseding mm -hmm. what he was able to do. I, I love that complete analytical mind and also questioning everything. I love that because just because we've heard something over and over at a certain tempo or a certain interpretation, nobody... Doesn't mean it's right, yes. Doesn't mean it's right, but also, you know, the, the fact that you question it, I think that act alone is something that should happen more often of course. With, with people who study this repertoire. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that kind of analytical mindset and also questioning of interpretation is how you came into play conducting, because that's another responsibility, if you say, of course. you know. I think the approach for when you're playing with um, orchestra remains very much the same as when you're playing with individual musicians. So from chamber music, of course, you graduate to a much larger group of musicians. But if you're dealing with, as I often have the privilege of doing, incredible and uh, very capable soloists in their own right who have wonderful ears and they pay attention to everything that you do and they want to follow you, they, they are with you in every note, then you really don't need that additional person there. And especially since in some works, such as the Beethoven Concerto, such as the Chopin Concertos, I not only know the orchestral score very intimately, but I also have a very clear vision of what I want to do in the pieces. And while I'm completely open to hearing new interpretations from the fantastic conductors that I work with, sometimes they have nothing to say. And that's just the simple fact that they are focused, they're engrossed in their symphony in the mm -hmm. second part yeah. of the concerto, mm -hmm. uh, and not so much in, in what they can do to help me create a wonderful masterpiece. And that's when really it comes into your own to be dealing with musicians who are all present and want to be there with you and not, don't just follow a baton, uh, don't just blindly play what's on the score. Mm -hmm. Of course, which especially with we are here in the temple of Chopin's music. Speaking about the Chopin concertos is highly needed, of course. And I wanted to ask you, since you did quite a focus on the early romantic repertoire in your recording history, um, what do you think is the specific character of Chopin works, especially with the orchestra? You also recorded not the concertos, but the other pieces yes. that are not so commonly played, uh, not only, well, uh, in the competition, of course, they're not in the, in the repertoire, but also in the concert life, they're not so commonly played, they're rondo, they're fantasy. So, and if you compare it to like Mendelssohn piano concertos or the pieces by Schumann, not only the concerto, but other, other, also the, the other two uh, pieces for piano and orchestra, what do you think is the main difference of course, I think many of us, including here in Warsaw, are quick to dismiss the orchestral accompaniment that, Pian that Chopin wrote as being inferior, essentially, to his piano writing, which is completely true. But there's no two ways about it. But I think his imagination uh, was more powerful than the sounds that we have of the orchestra in the hall. And we experience that with the concertos, of course, where we have wonderful solos in the bassoon, in the wind instruments that are almost unheard when you're playing them in a modern concert hall with a modern piano, with a modern string section, it's just impossible. You don't hear those details. And those details are actually what Chopin writes. So 
my approach to any of this music is that Chopin still wrote wonderful piano music, as he always did, with extra colors from the orchestra that I'm not able to make. And I have to work even harder than with the musicians of the orchestra to make those colors have meaning, to have, to have them make sense. Uh, and I think the biggest risk, of course, when you're playing Chopin's concertos is when you're playing them with musicians who don't know as intimately as we do as pianists the language of Chopin. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge. Because, of course, they will play Mendelssohn symphonies, they will play Beethoven symphonies, yeah. they will play Brahms symphonies. Yeah, Schumann. And but so there are no Chopin symphonies. Mm -hmm. And Chopin's language is unique. So for many musicians, if, of course, if we're speaking of an orchestra that doesn't get exposed to Chopin's music so often, it's completely new and it's foreign. And they come in with this preconceived notion that it's boring, that they have lots of whole notes, that they have not very much melody, and that it's awkward for them. And you have to sort of overcome those uh, boundaries, and, and then you can create a wonderful masterpiece. Absolutely. Of course. Mm -hmm. And since also singing is such an important part in Chopin's yes. music, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the cooperation with Matthias Görner. You recorded a fantastic Beethoven album with how did it start and how did it de <laughs> develop? Matthias actually reached out and he said, well, would you like to record uh, some Beethoven leader? I said, well, okay, but <laughs> I've never worked with a singer and I've never, well, not that I've never, but I've never professionally worked with a singer to, to actually do something that, of that sort of scale mm -hmm. in a project. And I'm not sure exactly how it will work. And Matthias said, well, I think you'll be fine. I love how you play piano and that'll be perfectly fine. And what actually convinced me is I was working with Antonio Papano, the very... Mm -hmm wonderful musician and fantastic conductor who not only conducts, of course, symphonic concerts, but also a lot of opera. And he said, Jan, you should be working with singers. And I said, well, actually, I have this proposal to work with a singer, Matthias Gerner, record this recording. He said, you should take it. You should totally do it. You'll be great at it. And he was right. It was a wonderful experience because it felt completely natural. Mm -hmm. There was no stress at all. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> um, what is up ahead for you? Um, you were actually, last night, just played Beethoven fourth piano That's concerto right. here in yes, Warsaw. Yes, Warsaw's musical scene is very, yes, very busy. Yes, yes, um, very, very it busy. It extends far past only the Chopin competition, incredibly. Uh, there was a concert at the opera last night where I played his fourth piano concerto, Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. And uh, it's nice because concert life has returned very much to normal. Uh, of course, there's different restrictions, different countries. We uh, still, I will have to be playing in masks in certain countries, in the States especially. Very unfortunate uh, that we have not overcome that point, but I'm very happy to see that we are making music. Pittsburgh Symphony, uh, San Francisco, going to, on a big tour with London Philharmonic, a tour in 2021 yes. in COVID, you know, the British Orchestra in Germany. It's so many boundaries that have been overcome, that it's amazing. And I'm very glad to have that chance. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, the restrictions, obviously the pandemic that we've been going through. How was that period for you? The uncertainty, I think, was the worst, as it was for all of us, the not knowing of what it would be, what it would entail for us, for our loved ones, for our health, for our profession, of course. But uh, I came to the realization through the pandemic that I actually really enjoy what I do. and. That sounds like a funny thing to, to say, but when you're playing 100 concerts a year, you don't stop at some point and say, well, do I really like what I am doing? No, well, mm -hmm. because you're living every day, and I, I was happy, so I never had the need to do it, but you don't realize whether I like music, whether I like playing concerts on stage, and having the lack of concerts for so long during the pandemic, for, well, for so long, for three months at the beginning of the pandemic, that three months made me realize very quickly that I do indeed miss being on stage. And that first concert in June of 2020 with audiences in the hall, and they were so excited to be there, and so was I, was incredible. And I've had that experience of, of me being excited and the audience being excited to be back in a hall so many times during the pandemic. And each time it's been this overwhelming joy. So that's, I think, one thing that I've come overcome through the pandemic as well. And we can Fantastic. feel your joy very, very yeah, clearly. Definitely. It's beautiful. So we are heading to the end, toward the end, and I have a very short last question. Since we are here at the Chopin competition, do you have some kind of suggestion you could make to the competitor of the competition? <laughs> mm, I think you should, and I say this actually to any student, anybody who's playing music, make sure you always love what you do. Uh, when I see some competitors enter on stage and I don't see a smile, but I see fear and I see trepidation. I, I pity them because I think you should be still enjoying what you do. Of course, it's highly stressful. And I've had 
hundreds of concerts like that where I, I'm really not entirely confident going on stage. Yes. I, I, can, I can commiserate, but if you're not happy doing what you do, if you're not happy in the studio practicing, if you're not happy going out on stage, then you should really think whether you want to do it because of it's course. a long life ahead. Yes. And this is going to be waiting for you every yes. time. So I think that's the only advice that I have. That's Make sure you, you share your love of music when you're on stage. Thank you so much. That's Thank perfect you. advice. <laughs> yes. And now we're back to the competition. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. A pleasure.